people become are successful because they're very good at a particular thing. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I will be speaking with Grant Duncan, the Managing Director at Global Leadership Advisory Consultancy, Corn Ferry. Grant has over 30 years of business experience gained in two professions. His first career saw him rise to leadership roles in a number of UK advertising agencies, uh, latterly as CEO of Publicis. His second career has been in executive recruitment, initially at the global executive search firm Spencer Stewart before joining Corn Ferry. Now this was a really fascinating conversation as we go deep into um, Grant's book which is titled Looking Beyond the Car in Front. And it's really a very powerful guide to explain from his own experience and from his own experience both professionally, um, you know, in an advisory capacity, as well as his own career journey himself. It talks a lot about how to plan your career and being able to really evaluate where you're at. So, in this episode, we look at how to avoid a career block. Grant gives us the steps to truly evaluating where you are, um, identifying your competencies, transferable skills, and where you excel, and also what you enjoy. Um, we discuss improving your self-awareness, and we talk about getting out of your swim lane or a burrow that you have created for yourself so that you can expand and even move disciplines, careers, or just grow in your professional life. So fantastic conversation. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Grant Duncan. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Grant, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Great, thanks. And lovely to meet you, Rian. Absolute pleasure to have you here on the show. And slightly different conversation today as you're not an architect, but actually a recruitment ex expert, um, an executive head headhunter. Um, you've written recently the, the book, Looking Beyond the Car in Front, which is really a a handbook for helping mid-tier professionals really foresee and kind of grab a hold of like how best to sequence and future-proof and design their careers going forward. And I think this is a really interesting conversation, certainly in the world of architecture, because it's something that often, and I would imagine in most professions, something that just really gets left to chance. Would that be fair? I think so. I, I mean, I, I can... I can kind of empathize with um, your uh, your peer group in the in the architectural profession because I actually spent the first 20 or so years of my career in advertising and you know I do think there are certain parallels there obviously a, you know a highly creative business um, but a business where there's a lot of there's a combination between left and right brain so quite logical uh, sort of uh, you know data based uh, thinking uh, allied with uh, with with real creativity, sort of magic and logic, if you like, which I think I see mm -hmm. the same thing in, in architecture. I think the other interesting correlation there is that, uh, as was the case with me, a, a lot of people do enter the advertising profession with the view that this will be their career for life, uh, particularly if you're a creative mm -hmm. person. So if you're an art director or uh, or copywriter, that's the skill. You, you have that's a skill you were born with in many instances and that's that is your uh that that is the route you're going to take probably for the rest of your career which um on the one hand is fantastic because you have complete clarity on that on the other hand uh, does lead to some of the issues and challenges uh that uh, that my book starts to explore around getting caught in a in a swim lane uh and you know not really knowing how to get out of it or how to uh how to adjust from that so um uh, so i you know i i, I do i do actually see uh, beyond obviously now i'm a i'm uh, i'm an executive search uh 
uh, headhunter, as you as you refer to it. And uh, so I, I'm meeting people from all kinds of uh, careers and all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, but I do, you know, hold in my mind very very clearly uh, those 20 years I had in advertising, and I do, as, as I say, sort of yeah. see the link through to, to architecture because of that. How how did you make this the the career transition then from the world of advertising into what it, what it is that you're doing now? Well, it, um, it it was quite a spontaneous thing, I would say, uh, because obviously I was um, uh, chief executive of Publicis, which is uh, the UK uh, arm of Publicis, which is a big global uh, ad agency network. Um, I. Yeah, I've done over 25 years in the industry. I'd obviously done pretty well to become the chief executive. I'd uh, been at the top of the sort of the, the pile for a few years. Uh, but the truth is, I was waking up in the mornings just not feeling very excited uh, about the day ahead. Mm. And, uh, you know, you, you can do that for a few days or a week or so. But then when it, you know, it becomes a routine issue, then you know there's, there's a problem. Uh, but, you know, and it's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I really ha didn't have uh, a strategy. I didn't have any thoughts about what I was going to do about this, other than I just had a very strong urge that I needed, and I was in my late forties at the time. I really needed to uh, think about doing something new because I couldn't. I, don't, I just didn't feel like I could sustain this uh, for uh, you know for the next ten, twenty years. And and also, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not if you're not on your A game. You, you you fail you start to fail in the job and I didn't want to fail in the job, so I did something yeah. it, which I, I I don't recommend to anybody uh, and that's again why I wrote the book to stop people sort of finding themselves in that situation. I just I resigned. Uh, I went to Morris Levy, mm -hmm. the fabulous um, at the time uh, chairman of Publicis, and, and said I just you know I. I I'd had enough and I needed to kind of rethink. He thought I was completely mad, um, but he was respectful of my yeah. decision. So I stepped away. Like my timing was lucky in the sense this was sort of 2007. So before the, the, the crash, uh, the, uh, remember the 2008 mm. crash. So I sold my shares. And so I had, you know, I had enough money to kind of keep the wool from the door for a time while I basically took a gap year, uh, to work out what it was I right. wanted to do. Um, and so, you know, we'll maybe talk later on about what I learned from that and how that might you know, help other people start to approach this in a slightly more sort of strategic way. But I was just very fortunate that one of the one of the uh, the uh, sort of advisory projects, if you like, I worked on was with somebody who was setting up a headhunting firm focusing specifically in the advertising sector. Uh, and it was there that I began mm -hmm. to understand, I could see then my transferable skills, which again, we may talk about uh, later on, how those could be applied to uh, to executive search. I didn't really want to do it in that uh, business because it was focused on advertising. I wanted to get out of advertising. So I was sure. just very fortunate. I was uh, uh, talking to one of the big global firms, Spencer Stewart, uh, who, as it, ha as it happened, had been looking for somebody to, to reboot their media practice. So I got that job in August 2008, and I think you'll a lot will remember Lehman's went down about four weeks later. So um, yeah. uh, I probably kind of got in just in the nick of time. Uh, and then you know that's been the last sort of 15 years of my career. Uh, really, really enjoying it. It was a, it was a. I was I think very lucky uh, to have found that. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of happenstance, but uh, I'm very fortunate. Uh, but what one of the reasons again for writing the book was I was lucky. Uh, and I began have began thinking in subsequent years. Actually, there are things that people can do in the run up to that moment because that moment will come for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of that that crossroads yeah. moment, uh, and uh, you know, at least having sort of thought that through, use certain of the sort of strategies I've I've talked about to get your mind ready for that moment is a lot better than relying on luck, which is what happened to me. Yeah, absolutely. And really, really fascinating. I'm sure a lot of our listeners will, will probably be able to kind of, you know, hear themselves in the in the story that of, you know, kind of working in a, a particular profession where, you, where you've invested so much into it. And you know, certainly in architecture, I think what happens is that there's such a there's such a strong structure in place to becoming a professional. And then once you've left your education, then you're on track to being an architect. And it's taken the best part of 10 years just to you know, be able to call yourself an architect. 
is it, it there becomes a, a great um, reluctance to want to stray off the path that's been created and mm -hmm. people will often find themselves in very unhappy situations and kind of talk themselves into staying in, in that position for long periods of time and then there might be something dramatic that happens and a sudden resignation um but how would you help people or advise that people start to be able to kind of audit themselves and evaluate like actually you know where are they now what are their options um what, what sorts of things should they be taking stock of yes well you know in many ways this gets to the heart of some of the guidance uh in, in my book uh there's lots of things that can mm -hmm. be done uh, uh but a lot of it comes back to uh almost a, you know auditing yourself uh auditing you know who you are uh what you really are you know in term as a as a as an executive as a practitioner as a working person uh and then trying to codify that in a way because what that immediately does it just gives you a framework uh, uh that you can refer back to when you're having those sort of moments of doubt or crisis uh if you know at some point like i did you decide to kind of you know, pull the parachute cord and go and jump out of the plane uh, or jump out of the plane and then pull the parachute cord because if you did the other way around, that would be quite tricky and it wouldn't end well. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, you, you're sort of half prepared for it. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's, that, that's you know, all, all I think people can really do. So, you know, how do you do that? So one thing I, I observed from my time in advertising, but also I've seen it in, in my subsequent career uh, as a headhunter, is that people become you know are successful because they're very good at a particular thing so if i use advertising as an example you know people become very successful because they're a great art director or a great copywriter and and, and you know hopefully become a creative director or like me you know you're a very good client relationship manager and that you know may take you up to the you know top of becoming the chief executive or a managing director or so on and there are very very sort of sub various sub disciplines you get that in the broader world of people who are very good at marketing you know become the chief marketing officer or people very good at finance become the chief financial officer uh which is great uh, because you're building on that and that's building your career and creating success and you're being paid more and promoted and headhunted and all those good things. But you are in one channel. Uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, my, my strong advice is obviously continue to do, you know, to, to do great work in that channel, but actually find the opportunities to broaden your, uh, your, your palette of experiences. Uh, and, and also rounding yourself out as uh, uh, as an executive. So there are a few you know a few things to think about here. One is uh, you know this whole area of, of risk taking. Uh, mm. uh, yeah, you know, I suppose a, a byproduct of st sticking in your in your channel is you're getting you, you, it's it's a comfort zone. You know what you're doing. You're really good at it. And almost you know the more you carry on that way the tougher it gets to kind of flip outside of that channel because, you know, what's, what happens if you move out of that comfort zone? So a uh, fear of failure uh, is, is, a re is a common issue uh, that uh, I find. Uh, and, and it is something that needs to be, to be grappled with um, because, you know, embracing, you know, taking risks and in, in many ways embracing failure, you know, d does ultimately lead to, Great job satisfaction, uh, you know, fulfilling mm -hmm. your potential, making a difference. Uh, so I embracing failure, feeling good about it, you know, finding the benefits, you know, so failure is not a nice thing, but you can turn it into, into positives around, oh. you know, understanding, you know, find the benefits of, of failures. Um, you know, when, when failure looks like it's coming, treat it as a challenge rather than, uh, than something, uh, to be f uh, fearful of. Uh, I think all of those, you know, all of those things are really important. So risk taking, I think, is, is an Im important uh, feature of, you know, of of the ongoing journey that people are on. Uh, related to that is getting in the firing line. Uh, you know, try and put yourself in situations where, you know, that may be a little bit unpopular uh, with with colleagues or people are shying away from. 
uh, because you know heading heading in heading somebody said to me heading towards the sound of you know bullets is quite a you know quite a scary thing to do but actually can be the you know can be the making of you uh, and one really good example actually was um as uh, one of the people i interviewed in the book is alan jope uh, who is recently left as the ceo of unilever and um uh, he was he's a, he, he is interesting because he was a lifelong unilever executive so didn't go to any other company always stayed at unilever but he became right. very successful because he took on the jobs that nobody else wanted to do. So while all his his sort of mm. colleagues and peers were doing the rather sexy sort of, you know, global brand manager of Dove, you know, and winning lots of creative awards at Cannes and all that sort of thing, he went to, you know, went to US, the US, to resuscitate the Vaseline brand that was, you know, in real trouble. Um he went and did sales jobs rather than, you know, he got out of marketing quite quickly and went into sales jobs, which, you know, are not everybody's sort of cup of tea. But actually, what really made him right. is he went to China. Uh, China, Unilever in China had been a basket case. I think they'd been through something like three or four managing directors there or general managers, I think they call them. Uh, and it was like, it was completely toxic. And he went there and he made a brilliant job of it. And that, you know, and he said, in, you know, in my, you know, he said, on my deathbed, I didn't want to uh, say, you know, the height the height of my career was, uh, you know, w- winning an award for best uh, sort of TV commercial at Cannes for, you know, for, for Dove. <laughs> what he wanted to be able to say was, I've yeah. been to China, to Malaysia, to Indonesia, to the state, you know, to all these amazing places. So, I, you know, so I think I think that getting in the firing line uh, is is part of that, you know, risk taking, failing, you know, failing better. That, that's that's it's, that's really inspiring to hear, actually, that, that this kind of, you know, encouragement to break out of the channel or the structure that, you know, in many cases, people have plowed for a long time. Um, what, what kind of practical advice would you suggest? Like, you know, just in terms of like finances, for example, and I, I know like in, in architecture, um, you know, one of the complaints you'll, you'll hear a lot in the industry is the, is the low salaries. And this is something that causes a lot of, a lot of pain in the industry. Yes. Um, but then that, that also, you know, that kind of caution and inadequacy or difficulties with, with money also mm. then becomes a trap in itself where people are, you know, they they don't feel like they've got the financial ability to be able to make a make a sharp much sharp decision, or failure becomes more heightened, if you like, or the fear of failure becomes more heightened because of a financial situation. How how what kind of advice would you give for people like that to like what how can they be orientating themselves in a way yeah. where they can take more risk? Well, I think uh, you know that that is a very uh, core issue uh, is is you you get to a point in your life where you know you probably you may not be enjoying it but you're doing okay you know and you're earning uh, well and that is you know as you do that of course your costs start to you know they almost sort of increase in, in direct proportion to your salary increases you know uh, but things yeah. happen you get married you buy a home you start having children you know the cost base starts to go up and particularly if you are the the main breadwinner or even a co it doesn't really matter. But you know, you're, you're making a big contribution to funding that life. Yeah, that become that really does become uh, a disincentive to take take a risk. But you know, what I would say is, in the end, it will get you. Um, and you know, I, I hate to say this, but you know, as you know, we all know what a pyramid looks like. You know, it's very, very narrow at the top. And so there are very few of those jobs, yep. you know, where you are the boss, you know, you're the, you are the lead partner yes. in a, in an architect's firm or you're the chief executive or whatever. There are not very few of those. So what happens mm-hmm. to all the other people who don't make it? Well, you know, they, they get mm-hmm. sort of, they get ejected out of the system in, in some shape or form. Mm-hmm. And, and what's quite uncomfortable is that quite often happens when people are in their sort of late forties or early fifties and they, they've still got you know, they've still uh, got a lot of commitments, but also they've got another 20, you know, God willing, 20, 30 years ahead of them. And suddenly they're, you know, yeah. they're on, quotes, on the scrap heap. So uh, so dealing with that, uh, and I would say taking the hit early is probably, you know, the right thing to do. If you feel that, you know, this is not for you, that you're not going to be running your own architects firm or, you know, uh, working in one of the big, you know, the, the big uh, architectural firms as a sort of senior partner or something. Um, if that's not uh, going to be for you, then you have to very early on start thinking about what your alternatives are and accept 
And as part of that, you're probably going to have to either take a hit financially or at the very least get yeah. sort of, you know, make a sideways move and get stuck there for a bit before uh, you then move on to the uh, uh, to the next stage. Um, so, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, you know, there are lots of things in the book about this, actually. So one mm-hmm. one exercise I think is really helpful um, is is a kind of what I call as a sort of poor man's icky guy, uh, which is mm-hmm. just look at three things, which is what do I need? What do I enjoy? Uh, and what am I good at? Uh, and I think, you know, that's almost like a bit of stock taking that's, that's worth doing at, at key points in your career anyway. But, you know, what do I need? Uh, well, we just talked about it. One thing is typically it's the economics. Uh, I need to earn a certain amount of money because I have these outgoings. And so I need to exceed those, you know, uh, exceed those outgoings. Um, uh, so, you know, yeah, that financial situation is really important. So kind of working out where the pain barrier is on that is, is quite, mm-hmm. quite important. But what do I need can also be, I need to have my own business, you know, or I need to be in a in a bigger organization because I just function much better in a bigger organization. Or um, I need to be in Manchester because, you know, that's where my elderly parents live uh, and I've got to be close to, you know, whatever it happens to be. So getting a clear sense of what you need is, uh, is, quite, is very important. Uh, but I think the other thing is what do I enjoy? Uh, because, you know, too many people are, are in jobs that, they don't really enjoy. Uh, they do them because it pays the bills, because it gives them a certain degree of sort of self-validation. But uh, do they really enjoy it? A lot of people don't, sadly. Uh, so, what is you know yeah. what is it, what is it that you enjoy? You know, there are it must have been moments in your career that you you really enjoyed what you were doing. So try and capture those. Try and capture that and understand what was it that you enjoyed to try and almost give yourself the. Uh, a reference point for then if you're going to jump out of this particular career what is the career that's going to al- actually amplify what you enjoy uh, or what scenario mm-hmm. is going to amplify what you enjoy so going back to my earlier point it may be that you're in a big you know corporate environment and you hate the politics and the complexity and the matrix reporting and all that sort of thing and what you you're, you're far more uh, at, at ease when you're kind of you've got a degree of independence you can do your own thing that's slightly that's sort of suggesting that you're probably better off in a smaller business or maybe starting up your own business. Conversely, there are some people yeah. I've spoken to who, you know, have found themselves in an early stage uh, business and absolutely hated it. You know, uh, hated the sort of ambiguity of it, the fact you got to, you know, you got to run around buying your own paper clips and actually yearn to go back into a corporate environment. So I think, you know, in what you enjoy is really important. And then I think the final thing is, um, what what are you good at? Uh, and I think this becomes mm-hmm. more important the more you know the older you get, or the more you know, advanced you get in your career, um, because uh, you know as you get more senior and as you get more responsibility, there is a sense that everybody around you is looking at you going, you you're you're the boss, so you must be good at everything. Uh, and of course that is absolutely not the case you cannot be good at everything yeah uh, the reason you're the boss is because you're good at something and the other things you know just sort of like come with it uh so a big part of this is actually in understanding what what you're you know what you you know what you're really good at and the book does talk a lot about um you know competencies uh, and identifying your competencies and that might sound like a bit of a sort of technical term um, but you know, mm-hmm. in, in simple terms, they're the sort of skills or behaviors that make you successful. Um, now the best way to describe this is almost like turning your, your CV inside out. So a typical CV is just a list of jobs and it with dates and, you know, sort of things that you did. Uh, so it's kind of quite, it's the, it's the, the what I did, uh, competencies yep. are how you did it. Uh, and then, and what what fell out of that? So, you know, um, you, you know, you might be uh, a real, a natural diplomat, you know, who's very good at sort of walking into a situation where there's conflict, where there's argument, there's politics, and sort of somehow uh, aligning people, you know, and getting to to, to a solution. 
So what you are there for is you're really good, you know, balancing stakeholder needs. You know, that's the sort of skill set. So that's a competency is stakeholder management. Right. Um, another one yeah. might be, you know, you might be a very sort of outcome, discipline, outcome oriented person, you know, who's very good at, you know, what's the sort of the, the end task. Um, so, you know, the competency there is uh, ensuring accountability. You know, you're, you're, that is, that is actually one thing you're, you know, you are good at is ensuring accountability. Or, um, you know, maybe you're sort of really comfortable with, with trial and error, um, experimentation, ambiguity. Um, and that, again, that's a competency. Uh, so it's about bringing, identifying what those are and bringing those out because then that, that starts to give you a very clear indication of the kind of environment that you're going to, that you're going to succeed in. Uh, the other thing it does, by the mm -hmm. way, is it starts to give you a clue as to what your transferable skills are. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that that's, I think people find that very hard. Um, can you, can you say, well, I'm, you know, I'm an, uh, I'm an accountant in a, in an architect's firm, you know, what are the, where, where are the transferable skills there? But actually, you know, if you start to think, well, less about, you know, the what you're doing in that job as a, an accountant or in the finance firm, but the how you did that, that starts to give you some indications of where actually I could apply that in a, in a slightly di a different environment. Um, it, so it's really kind of fun to, you know, give yourself a little bit of altitude, if you like, in, and, and a broader perspective on what it is that you're doing and not get so sort of kind of hung up on the, the kind of the very specific tasks that you might be doing inside of a, a, a particular company, but actually, those are there's a way of doing something there which is you know can be very very easily moved on to another another task or another exactly. process or another series yeah. of things do you recommend that um people work with somebody to help them identify these things because i imagine this process being quite difficult to do it yeah. as a self-reflection yeah it, it, funny enough i'm just going to come on to say that as a brilliant segue to the to my next point which is yeah, let's call it self-awareness um right you know, that can come in lots of different shapes and forms. So, uh, well, let's start with the one you mentioned, which is a mentor or a coach. That's, they are two different mm -hmm. things, uh, but they are, they, they amount to the same thing. Um, you know, a coach, typically coaches are something that you ought to pay for, uh, unless you happen to have a, you know, somebody who is trained, you know, properly trained and happy to do a bit of, um, uh, you know, sort of free consulting, but typically, you know, coaches and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, but coaches are, are specifically trained, uh, to try and help shape some of these, some, some of these discussions. Um, and, and you don't have to have a coach all the time. You can sometimes, there may be a moment in your life where a bit of coaching would be really helpful to get you sort of, uh, get you aligned, uh, and get you on the right trajectory. So, you know, a coach and, and and probably trained coaches are very good at sort of deconstructing you uh and you know breaking down into your component parts and then sort of helping you helping you sort of rebuild those um the other route uh which is probably a bit more intuitive and a bit more personal is a mentor and that mentor can come from within the organization that you uh you, you work in preferably not your your boss um because it you know that it sort of uh, it, it can confuse the dynamic a little bit between yourself and the boss because um, you do right. need a bit of distance and objectivity there, but it could be another person in the organization uh, who you like and trust, mm -hmm. uh, or it could be somebody from outside the organization, but somebody who's there almost sort of, um, you know, on tap, uh, you sort of call up and say, gosh, I really need your help you know, working this one through. Uh, yeah. And typically, you know, I'm really struggling having a, a difficult time politically within this organization. These people are creating real problems for me. You know, give, what, what would, you know, let me talk to you about it and then help sort of guide me on that. Or it might be, you know, more broad, a uh, more broad conversation about, um, you know, I, I've been offered this great job, um, but I don't know if I should take it. What do you think? So, but I think, you know, having that, ex I mean, the main point here is having a third party, uh, an individual who has got no ax to grind, has got no real, you know, uh, no agenda other than to give you the best advice. Uh, sometimes advice you may not want to hear as well. That's the other important thing is it can't just be a mate because the trouble with mates is they're going to go, Oh God, you know, I better not pull on, you know, he's going out through a hard time. I'll just sort of tell him what he wants to hear. Um, you need, you need that person to be you know, really, really objective and to be able to, you know, 
give you some tough love if you if you like. So that's that's one mm-hmm. thing. What are your what are your thoughts on things like personality profiling tools? Yeah, in this kind of uh, world, absolutely. Uh, I, I think that uh, there's, so there's a more sort of scientific uh, approach to that, which is yes, yeah, there are there are these profiling tools. You know, uh, I, I I don't know, but I'm I'm pretty sure you can get them all online. But you know, a firm, a firm like Corn Ferry right. has a brilliant profiling tool. All the big sort of executive search firms and headhunters, you know, the kind of more the more sort of blue chip ones will will absolutely have uh, these as a sort of uh, as a standard. Uh, they're really helpful. The only thing is they do need a narrative to accompany them. And that'd be my only concern is, you know, particularly if you're sort of taking something off the shelf, um, you'll get a sort of readout, mm-hmm. you know, with lots of sort of, you know, lines through it and greens and ambers and reds. And uh, and then, it, you know, it's a bit like self-diagnosing on Google. You know, you could end up going down completely the wrong path or getting very, you know, disillusioned or, you know, disheartened because of what this thing is telling you it does need a narrative and so you know at corn ferry we would always accompany that um the data that comes out of those tests uh the sort of psychographic tests with, with uh you know a narrative an individual walking you through the the, the meanings for those uh, of those findings so there is that um in your own organization uh, a really easy one and it's one that uh, i think you know we all, brits particularly find a bit tricky is just asking you know when you had a meeting asking your colleague how do you think that went how do you think i did mm. would you change anything that i we did you know that sort of yep. constant feedback uh you know it's not something that we do very well because you know it's, it can be a bit uncomfortable um, but you know, as an as an organisation, if you if it becomes normalised, then it leads to much, again a kind of more uh, honest, open sort of oxygenates uh, you know discussions around performance and and performance improvement because you're doing it every day as opposed to leaving it to the annual review. And you know, one thing I, again I see again and again is people get to the annual review and they get hit with bad news and they go, well, hey, whoa, where's that come from? You know, no, you know. I've been for the last 12 months, everything seems to be fine. And yet now I'm getting a negative performance review. Why didn't somebody tell me before? So I could have done something about it. So absolutely, you know, ensuring that there is a proper uh, 360 degree, uh, you know, assessment done by your, you know, by your boss, by your, by HR team or whatever, whoever, whatever the company uh, uh, structure is, is really important. But actually just as important is those sort of regular uh, bits of um, feedback, uh, which uh, constantly sort of help you uh, course adjust. Um, I remember we spoke previously and you were talking about evaluating and looking at your career in kind of time chunks. Can you yes. speak a little bit about about that and how that kind of relates back here to kind of you know if we're if we're thinking about our skier in in five to ten year increments mm. and what does that mean in terms of like competencies and transferable skills? Yes, no, I, I think I, I yeah it's something I wish I'd done. I must say um, was to think in terms of mm. five to ten year increments because it, it is very easy for time to fly by, uh, particularly if you're doing okay. Um, you, if you're doing well and it's all going well and there's life goes mm-hmm. on and as I say, you know, you have a family and, you know, there's all lo- loads of stuff going on. And before you know it, you know, eight years has gone past. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, and the, again, the problem with that is, uh, it's all going really well, but then something might happen that is unexpected. Uh, so, uh, a new, a new chief executive arrives. Uh, with a completely different idea of what they want. And, or, and by the way, they're bringing their own people in. And no matter how good you are, you're probably going to be, you know, a victim of that. Or there's a merger between two co- your, your company and another company, and there's two of everything. And so that means, you know, between two of you, one of you's got to go, and it might be it might be you. Uh, or yeah. there might be a big economic crash, you know, like the 2008, like we're going through at the moment, actually doesn't seem to have fed through yet into mass redundancies. But um, if you look yeah. at the tech companies, you know, Facebook, Google, these guys were laying off thousands of people, uh, you know, a few months ago. These things just sort of can't happen and come out. And, and no matter how good you are, you, you could be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, apart from all the other things we've been talking about, which are sort of preparations for that for that moment, I think the other thing is to have a game plan. 
you know, think about, right, what, what, what mm -hmm. do I want to be in the next X years? So, um, you know, keep it simple, five years, 10 years. Uh, and one way of sort of playing that game actually is think, well, what does my life look like in five years time or in 10 years time? Uh, and a lot of that depends on your age and stage. So, you know, if you're 25, what does my look, life look like in five years time is probably, you know, a better version of what I've got at the moment. You know, I've been promoted. Mm -hmm. I'm earning more. I've got enough now that I can, you know, pay deposit on a house, on a, on a flat. You know, you know, I can afford to pay a mortgage. You know, so those horizons are a little, a little sort of narrower, perhaps. Um, but you know, as you go further up the, the sort of the food chain, then it's like so. In five years' time, I absolutely want to be uh, uh, leading, you know, the, a division uh, or running a function. Uh, or in five years' time, I want to have built up enough capital to invest in my own business. Later on in life, it might be um, uh, I need to ensure that I've got enough financial stability because actually I want to retrain as a cheese maker, you know. Or actually, yeah. I just want to—I always want to check out. I don't want to lie on a beach, you know, for the rest of you know rest of my days. Mm -hmm. So depending on what that picture is you then need to reverse back from that you need to reverse engineer that back into where you are now and what you therefore need between now and that that picture to get you there uh, and i think that you know i really like that idea and it sort of comes back to the sort of metaphor of um you know the car in front which is you know and yeah the metaphor is sort of pretty self-evident but if you just are staring at the car in front as you're driving along and you're just sort of like on autopilot you know, uh, there's a very great danger that when that car turns left, you turn left and you end up in, you know, the Sainsbury's car park. You think, well, what am I doing here? That, that was never the plan, you know. Um, you've got to sort of actually, you've got to be thinking what's beyond that car so that I can then decide, you know, am I going to turn right, turn left? What am I going to do at the next mm -hmm. set of traffic lights? Sort of thinking beyond that. So that's this exercise in taking a five to 10 year view is part of that is, you may never do it. You may never, you know, run your own uh, cheese shop, but at least you've got that as a reference point. So you can then explain to yourself in five years time why you didn't end up opening that cheese shop actually for probably very good reasons. Um, but I think you need to yeah. kind of have that target. Otherwise you'll just, you'll just be looking in increments of three months, six months, 12 months, which, uh, you know, can, well, basically lead you into the Sainsbury's car park. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think that um, businesses should be doing this sort of process all the time with their employees? And uh, uh, actually yeah. kind of helping, ha helping them take stock and helping them design where it is that they're mm -hmm. that they're going so that it's not a surprise? A absolutely. Uh, now, of course, c there are companies that do do this very well. They tend to be big, mm -hmm. well resourced, you know, businesses, but they do it very well. So Procter and Gamble were famous for this, where you went in um, the, in the graduate scheme, and over a period of ten years, they would put individuals into completely different sets of roles, arming them to become a general manager. To so the idea, well, they took a ten-year horizon, which is in ten years, you, if you if you do this well, you will become a general manager. Um, and and it was a brilliant, brilliant. So you know, so you do. Uh, few years as in marketing and brand management then you go into sales then they might give you um a big global brand to run then they move you to run a small market you know run be gm of mm -hmm. png romania uh then back to the to the corporate head office again you know bit by bit um and it's it's really interesting that if you look at some of the the the, the leaders in uk plc today they all came through that, uh, through that PNG system. So Gavin Patterson, who was chief executive of, of British Telecom, Phil Jansen, who's just now leaving, who also became, uh, uh CEO of, of British Telecom. You've got Tim Davey, who is the, uh, director general of the BBC and so on. You know, mm -hmm. these are, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, there was a 10 year horizon there, which is we're going to get you to general management in 10 years and we're going to you know, build the kind of component parts to get you there. Um, so now, of course, that's all very well if you're Procter and Gamble or Unilever or whatever. But if you are a yeah. 20 person, you know, uh, architectural practice, that's, you know, 
the resources aren't necessarily there. But but I, but I do think you know it is incumbent on the senior partners or the founders, you know, to to actually put invest much more into those sort of help sort of helping people through that sort of career journey um, by putting in place you know the right kind of training or the right opportunities thinking creatively about and you know, even if it's a bit painful you know we've got sense over here is great working on this particular project but you know it'll be better for them if they went if we move them to something else or we move them to another country and we're going to lose them for two or three years but it's better we do that yeah um uh, then mm -hmm. they just get stuck in a rut and then they and they get bored and and by the way there's a whole separate conversation about you know millennials and Gen Zs, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who have a completely different expectation uh, of of what a, what a job is and what a career is, and they absolutely have an expectation that lead leaders will be creative and proactive in putting interesting opportunities within that organisation in front of them, because if they don't, they're just going to go, um, because yeah. you know that 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 that, that concept of a career for life or staying in one, one, you know, God forbid, you know, one company for life, uh, has just completely gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you want to retain, it's, a, it's actually a critical retention tool. If you want to retain your best young talent, you've got to work much, much harder at creating, uh, opportunities that stimulate, uh, create, you know, diverse experiences for, for that generation. Otherwise they'll simply leave. Well, that, that's, that's really interesting. I and mean, we're seeing a lot of this in the architecture industry, you know, across the globe where there is a, a kind of exodus that's happened of mid tier professionals. I mean, I would kind of fall in this, fall into this myself of, you know, moving away from the architecture profession and, and move into something else. And it has created this kind of void of experience that's there. Um, and, you know, there's been a bit of a failure of lots of businesses being able to, um, maintain and retain people um, mm. because of exactly what you're what you're yeah. what you're talking about. And they, yeah. people even see that well, I'm you know I'm not getting the kind of career advancement that I was looking for. Either I'm going to go off and do it myself, or there's other companies and there's there's less of them. But those companies tend to be the ones that attract the talent and retain the talent, and then they're the ones that grow and dominate a marketplace. Yeah. Completely. Uh, I mean, that, it, it's a real issue. And it's, you know, it's not just the architectural profession. I mean, everybody is facing it, but particularly uh, organizations that are working with a traditional model, uh, which is, you know, anybody apart from, you know, um, the, the big tech platforms like Facebook and Google and so on. That's why they've been so successful in, in, in attracting great talent. But any sort of high growth digital business, they completely understand how that how that works and how to create a sort of uh, a more sort of cellular call it sort of career journey for uh, for for their younger their younger staff um mm. you know where training and development you know is, is really important um you know also there's a whole area of sustainability and purpose you know operating as a purposeful organization doing the right thing unfortunately you know the model that's in the minds of a lot of leaders aged over 45 50 is a very very traditional model uh and, it, and it's simply not good mm -hmm. enough for example to say which it was in the case of advertising by the way you know look at me i'm your creative i'm the creative director or i'm the chief executive one day you could be like me you know but in the meantime you've got to just you know you've got to take a lot of crap uh and you know do a lot of horrible late nights and you know weekend shifts and uh we're going to pay you really badly uh and all those things yeah you know, but but you one day you're going to be like me and, and i think a lot of that generation looking at that person going but i don't want to be like you i think you're completely the wrong yeah. role model for me uh and by the way i'm not willing to uh you know to work you know every weekend uh, just to sort of make you richer mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it's a slightly sort of caricatured example, but, uh, that, that is, that is something very serious, I think. But, I, but, but, but I think that that's a very, that's a very, very, you know, you know, it might be a, a bit of a characterization, but it's actually, you know, there's a, there's an enormous amount of, uh, truth in that. And that will hold true for a lot of, a lot of people of like, exactly. You're looking up towards, uh, a generation of, uh, of of leaders above you and people are thinking i don't i don't want that that's not that's not worth it this is yeah. this this what i'm doing right now is not worth it i'm there's got to be something else and so that's yes. why we're seeing so much movement 
yeah. and businesses really needing to up level in terms of being able to retain talent and be able to communicate mm -hmm. powerfully with you know younger younger generations and there is a very different culture and set of standards that are beginning to emerge and, you yeah. know many 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 for the better some not so much yeah very interesting um so in in your your current role what you do now as a um recruitment expert what kind of process do you do with people how do people work with you well we um we 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 sort of face two ways really you know the one one face is to our the client community so we have clients who typically will come to corn ferry looking you know for a senior level you know we operate at sort of pretty senior level sort of c level and c minus one the c minus two um it, companies will have an, a, a recruitment need uh, so they may have uh the ceo may have you know uh, retired or resigned um or the CFO may have got poached and you know gone to you know to another company, so there's a, there's a there's a gap that needs to be filled. So they will come to us to help us fill that gap. In the meantime, the other face is pointing out to um, potential candidates. So the kind of the pools of candidates that are out there, because our job is you know once that client says we need a new CFO or CMO or CEO is to pretty much have in our, our minds, and you know, and this is the brief, uh, to pretty much have in our minds, a, you know, a list of at least you know five to ten people we think, yeah, they, they could be right for this because we know because we're out there talking to people, uh, we know who where the talent is, who who the best people are, and and sort of create that connection. That's a sort of massive oversimplification of, of what we do, um, because actually there's a lot you know in between that, which is not dissimilar. I mean, I think, you know, in many ways, we're not dissimilar to um, strategy consulting uh, businesses, because actually, a lot of it is about understanding at a very profound level, what that company's business targets are, its objectives, what is, you know, what that new leader will be coming into, what the, the you know, the, the, the success metrics are for that role, and so on. And, you know, really sort of understanding that in a way that somebody from a McKinsey or a BCG would really uh, also understand, so that you're actually making a very sort of, you've got a very clear understanding of what the brief is, um, and then a way of articulating that to, to the outside world, and then most critically measuring you know, the, the candidates and their, you know, how, how many, in a sense, how many boxes do they tick of that, uh, of the key requirement? And funny enough, uh, that very process is, was the transferable skill that I, I saw from advertising yeah. into, uh, into executive search. Cause that's what you do in advertising. You sit down with the board, with the senior level, uh, management to write, we've got this brand here. It needs resuscitating, reviving. You know, mm -hmm. you go through all the data, all the market research you know, uh, the sort of customer feedback and you, you know, as an agency, your job is to uh, really kind of create a compelling proposition and brief that then gets handed to the creative department who then, and, you know, the version of the candidate in advertising is the, is the, is the campaign, you know, is the, is the advertising or marketing campaign. So, um, so that in simple terms, that's, that's uh, what we do, but a lot of it is, it's high stakes because, you know, a new CEO for a public company, uh, can you know, make or break you know the the success of that business, but you know getting the right person can create a, you know an absolutely amazing multiplier effect in terms of you know return mm -hmm. on you know investment and uh, shareholder return and so on. Amazing, brilliant, brilliant. And if so, um, if if people are kind of going through this quandary themselves, or they're looking to really des uh, design their career, is it something that you know they can reach out to to you or to Corn Ferry? I, um, what would you suggest you know, that it's not that, that's not that what we do um you know actually funny yeah. enough that's more what you know uh, the sort of the coaching sort of profession do interestingly um yeah. i mean i wrote the book purely because i uh, you know as you can see i've had lots of sort of experiences lots of ideas in my head which i just wanted to commit to paper because uh you know the experience i went through and it could have been so much better if i'd you know if i'd had my book you know 15, 20 years ago, um, things might have, you know, turned out very differently or maybe been the same, but actually it would have been, I'd have been going into it in a more structured, structured way. 
Um, so no, I can't promise that that's you know uh, what would come you know if somebody approached Corn Ferry um, or indeed any of the other the uh, big big search firms. Um, but you know, I don't think you know almost the point of having the book is you can do this yourself. Yeah, you don't need to yeah. pay somebody to do this. You don't have to pay a coach to sort of help you with this. You can actually do it yourself because a lot of it is is common sense. But sometimes when it's about you, things about yourself are, are much more difficult to unpack because it is you, you know. And so it's a way – it's almost like an out-of-body out of, you know, out of body experience. It's a way of taking outside of yourself – and analyzing yourself and, uh, and then, to, and then actually do taking control of it yourself. So I would, in fact, I would say, you know, there are, you know, very few people out there who do this thing as a, you know, do it as a profession, um, other than the coaching, uh, sort of, uh, con you know, community that actually you don't really need them. You can do it yourself. I love it. I love it. Amazing. Brilliant. Well, Grant, thank you so much for sharing your, 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 your personal experiences and your enormous breadth of knowledge here in terms of career development and, you know, the, the insights that you've, that you've garnered from several, you know, working in multiple industries and working with lots of people. So I really, really appreciate this. And I think this is a really important conversation uh, and very privileged to have had you on the show. So thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.